So my name is Liam Bullingham. I'm an assistant director here at the Library and Cultural Services in the University of Essex. And um, I, as, so, as such, I'm in a leadership role here. So this is kind of my perspective and my, my colleagues will have um, you know, different perspectives. But so I'm really thinking about, you know, this, the skills of our our staff body, um, how we can, how we can prepare them for AI, and how we can provide the best possible um, student experience. So let's introduce our other panelists. Um, Beth, if you could go first, please. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Beth. I am the content delivery coordinator within Library and Cultural Services at the University of Essex. Um, the main part of my role is I work with module supervisors to help create reading lists and also work with students for interlibrary loans. So it's all uh, about requesting resources. Um, so I'm particularly interested in how AI may change the landscape of searching for resources and what tasks can and even should be automated in my role. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Una, please. Hi all, uh, I'm Una. I am an academic support librarian for postgraduate talk students within Library and Cultural Services at the Uni of Essex. So I have a very student facing role. So I deliver mostly information literacy teaching um, aimed specifically at postgrads, but also just generally to our students um, working with both embedded sessions within um, departments and our open workshop program. Brilliant, thank you. So, like I say, let's move on to our three sections now. Um, but before we do so, I'll just set the scene a little bit. Um, I know you've already heard a lot about AI. So, um, as we see it, generative AI tools based on large language models have had a profound effect on universities and research libraries. And the way people find information, they do research, they produce academic content, it, these are it's bringing fundamental changes to these and concepts such as authorship and plagiarism, which we'll look at. Academic integrity is very important here, of course. And we're perhaps, I feel, still in a Wild West period where we've had an initial round of policy from universities, but that could soon fall out of date as the, the game moves on um, and become less relevant. So my co-presenters and I think that um, skills are really crucial here and that both librarians and other library staff and learners can adapt and take opportunities um, or possibly be led behind by market forces. Let's see. Okay, um, Una, please um, go ahead with the first section. I It's my job to share the slides, so I will get doing that. Yeah, so I think what I really wanted to start with is just to make sure we're all on the same page when we are talking about this. Some people may be familiar with the idea of prompt engineering, um, but I think what I'd like to really start with is just this um, this idea of what prompt engineering is. So it's, there's lots of different definitions out there, but what it generally boils down to is this idea of optimizing or fine-tuning prompts. Uh, when you're working especially with generative AI to achieve more relevant outputs. And generative AI, for anyone not familiar with that term yet, um, is generally any kind of AI tool that creates new content based on training data and it has parameters that decide on how it generates that content. Uh, so it's generating something new based on what is in its in its, in its training data, but not necessarily new knowledge. It's just, you know, recreating um, information based on, on what it's in its training data. And I think what we really wanted to come across with this session is that there's been a lot of talk about the skills and how generative AI and AI generally is going to change the skills of users, whether that's students, staff or researchers, but not as much focus on us as information professionals, as librarians. So what we were hoping to do with this session is talk about some of the potential issues or some of the skills that we might want to learn as librarians and whether we should, why we should, why should we care about this and what we can do with that. Um, so Leah, maybe if you can move on to the next slide. So I'm going to be coming on to the, uh, the issues in the, in the slides, but I wanted to start with was really talk about this kind of worrying trend that we've seen in terms of the, there are a lot of AI tools out there and they're developing very quickly. And um, they are, um, there are lots and lots of new tools coming out and that's where this idea of prompt engineering seems to have really picked up from is there is a, a huge corporate push towards these new job roles 
of prompt engineers that are going for quite high salaries. And I think what we're seeing with that is these sort of GPT hacks, prompt libraries, paid AI models, prompt engineers kind of pointing towards a monetization of information retrieval. And that's where I think we come in as librarians, because as librarians, because when you look at what prompt engineering is or how it works and how you can optimize these these prompts and work with these tools, it's actually quite a very similar skill to uh, traditional uh, librarian and information literacy skills. And I'm not the first one to, to make that point or point that out. There are plenty of people out there who've made this connection um, and plenty of people who've talked about this. Um, but I think that's where we have this opportunity to, to come in and, and become experts or take charge of this emerging landscape where we can help students and ensure that they've got access to the best information. Because I see libraries really as places of knowledge for everyone, um, as places where anybody can come and access information without having to pay for it, without having to have a specific mandate for that. It's almost like equity of access to information. And I think this is why our focus at Essex especially has been on free tools. And we're gonna talk a little bit later in the session about the digital divide and the differences in student skills and focus back more on students. But that's where especially where we, we have focused on free tools to make sure that we're not creating those bigger gaps between some students who have access to or the funds to to pay for premium tools and subscriptions to AI tools and that sort of thing. But a lot of the traditional information literacy skills are available for anyone and you don't necessarily have, have to have access to a premium paid tool in order to be able to, to use the skills um, of prompt engineering. So something like optimizing prompts and how to make those prompts better. Um, and I think this is where it's really tricky to provide guidance on the ethical AI use because there aren't really, it's only an emerging field. Prompt engineers haven't been around for a very long time. So, and whereas librarians have, and a lot of the skills are very similar, but there are also differences in between the ways these tools work and we don't still have a great understanding of things such as copyright and how that works with, with AI and a lot of these tools and how we can support student use of them because as Liam pointed out, we've been in this kind of initial round of policy, but a lot of these tools are still developing and things are changing still very quickly. Um, so I think it's, it's quite a difficult area to really authoritatively say to students, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, this is how these tools work, and this is where you can go and get the most up-to-date information because that changes so quickly. Um, and I find that I spend a lot of time trying to keep up to date with, um, with new developments in AI. I spend a lot of time both reading papers, but also just watching videos on places like YouTube and TikTok, because that's where our students are. And those are the places our students are getting this information from, whether that's good or bad, you know, that's where they are and that's where our audience is. Um, and seeing the tools that come out of those, um, those videos and those discussions, and then I go and try and experiment with them. But that's a lot of work. And no matter how much time I spend with it, I feel like I'm still falling a step behind. Um, and I always, whenever I run an AI tool session for our students, a student will come and say, what about this tool? I've used this tool. Is this a, a good tool to use? And it will almost always be something I've never even heard of or not had a chance to, to try. So I think it's really quite tough to stay up to date with these tools. Um, but again, that's where I think we can cut in and help cut down some of that information overload by focusing on the skills rather than the tools themselves and where we can help students focus on using their information literacy skills and digital skills to help them cut through the noise and figure out the parts of um, how to use information retrieval skills, their critical thinking skills, and find ways to use the information they get from AI tools ethically and use these tools as ethically as possible. So there are lots of things that I feel like we don't have control over, necessarily things like environmental impact, but there are ways that we can mitigate those impacts and help students focus on the skills and focus on the ethical use of these tools. So maybe we will move on to the next slide and talk about some of the questions on how do we, so we've got some questions like, how do we engineer prompts that can reduce hallucinations? So this is something that has been talked about a lot um about how these tools tend to hallucinate answers 
So most of you may have seen or heard of, you know, things like ChatGPT generating fake references or bringing in poor, poor quality references. So are there ways that we can write prompts and teach students to write prompts that reduce these hallucinations? Is there an intrinsic way of, of writing those prompts? Um, I don't have a strict answer to that. I know there are ways that we can get more helpful outputs from these tools. And we generally teach to our students um, kind of three main ways of, of writing better prompts, which are making, uh, being concise, uh, being logical and being clear. So you want to be really clear about what you want these tools to do. You want to be very concise about the way you write them. So the more complex you get with these prompts, the more unnecessary information that, or that's the more places the tool has to, to go and get, get confused. It's almost like you're talking to a person. If you give them loads and loads and loads of information, they're not going to pick out your key message. So it's almost more helpful to go and write shorter prompts, get an answer, write another short prompt, get another short answer, and then retweak and tweak and tweak and get those conversations going that way rather than trying to want, write one long, big prompt that will get you one long, big answer um, out of which you then have to sift through. And that's how I feel like it will also be easier for our students to figure out whether the answer is good or not because they are answering, they are only looking at one small chunks, um, small smaller chunks at a time. Um, but if anybody else has any other approaches they've taken, any other ways that they teach students, please do share, do ask questions. Um, so this is your, your chance to come in and talk to us. And Liam and Beth, if you have anything to add, feel free to, to jump in as well. Um, I just do it while people think of things and stick their hands up to join us. I would just maybe echo a couple of things. Um, I, one of the things I'm really pleased that Una does in these sessions is, is has, you know, has, she has the humility to ask the students, well, what do you use? What do you find? I, I think that's just such a good idea. And it's just something I wouldn't have thought of myself. And I, I'm really good that I'm really glad to see that bears fruit. And in terms of reducing hallucinations, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could, when you when it generates content for you and generates references for you, if you could say, oh, please run these against Crossref or you know, JISC Library um, Discover or something like that, just as that verification step. If, if the prompting was that easy, it would be great. Uh, there's a comment in the chat about um, in this about someone who had been in this morning session where we talked about the cross between AI literacy and information literacy. Um, and someone who pointed out that in their group that they were talking about prompt gurus who put lots of time into um, learning how to use generative AI a couple of years ago and have now kind of graduated into being paid lots and lots of money for these, these kind of newer tools that have come out. And that's exactly what I was kind of talking about in the beginning um, in the intro, very brain dumpy intro bit. Um, of, of seeing these crowds of, of people who were kind of part of this, this crypto NFT folk who've now almost created this monetization of information retrieval. And there are these countless of websites that you can go on to where you can get buy access to a prompt library, or you can get, you know, subscribe to my newsletter for hacks on how to write prompts for, for chat GPT and those sorts of things. And that's why I think we have almost like a responsibility to, to figure out how these tools work and teach our students to do that so they don't fall into these traps of spending lots and lots of money with, with people who don't necessarily have their best interest in mind in this very corporate kind of approach to, to information retrieval. So in this landscape, we not only have prompt engineers, we have prompt gurus who are yeah. in it for the monetization. How dizzying. Okay. Um, we have a question. Um, do students come with pre-existing knowledge of how to write a good prompt? Um, in my experience, that, that varies a lot. You come with certain students who've played a lot with these tools and know what they're doing and can, can write prompts. Um, they might just be there wanting that extra bit of information of what they can and cannot do. So because a lot of the sessions that I run are focused on the ethical side of AI tools, so they might have an idea of how to write good prompts but they want to understand what they can and cannot do from the academic point of view. But I would say the high majority come with no clue. They've maybe gone on to chat GPT once or twice, written a couple of prompts, not gotten very far, gotten a little bit frustrated or not really knowing what they're doing. And then they come to these sessions hoping to get an idea of how they can 
make use of it because they've either been told by their lecturers to to give it a go or experiment or they're just otherwise worried or stressed um, and I think a lot of this boils down to confidence on how confident they feel with their, their digital skills their writing skills their academic skills um, and a lot of them come with not a lot of an not a very strong idea of how to write good prompts they do tend to come with an idea of what they want from these tools which is helpful for for us to work with them um and they come with a lot of preconceived ideas of what they can and cannot do which is also interesting sometimes where they go well if i just use it to write and then just edit it isn't that the same as paraphrasing and we kind of have to explain to them well not really because you didn't really read the original you didn't write the original um, and that could be a very tough conversation to have with some of our students Just for um, while we're waiting for people to either join us or ask a few more questions in the chat, um, just give give everyone a bit of context. Um, and I might miss this, but what what are the titles of some of the workshops you run, Una, that um, relate to to AI and literacy and and this? Uh, so the main one that I run is called Using AI Tools Ethically, which is basically where the first part of the session we cover. The, we have some central university guidance on using AI, so what they can and cannot do, what constitutes an academic offence and that sort of thing. Um, and then we look at writing prompts and how tools like ChatGPT can hallucinate. So we show them a couple of example questions of how these tools get things wrong. So the usual one that I run is who's the prime minister of the UK? Because 80% of the time, the free version of ChatGPT answers Boris Johnson to that question. And then I usually show them if you create references using a generative AI tool, most of the time they either don't exist or they're just not very good quality. So not something you'd be able to use in an academic essay or an academic piece of coursework. Um, and then we usually look at other AI tools out there. So the second part of the session, we look at other tools. So the way we've, we've done it, depending on numbers, we either get different people to look at different tools and feedback on what they think their favorite feature is, or sometimes I just do a quick demonstration of a couple of different tools and ask them what they think about these tools and how they they might use them. Uh, sometimes we have done an embedded session. We do the first kind of part of, of the ethics side of how they can um, use these tools ethically and how they can reference their AI use as well. So that's one of the other things that we cover as part of these sessions is how they reference. Um, so being able to, to reference the tools that they use, what format they should use for them, at what point should they reference these tools? Because a lot of the times, if they're just asking it for keywords, they're really the same as sitting down when somebody else used this um, analogy in the first session this morning, is sitting down with a pen and paper and brainstorming keywords. You're still picking out which keywords you use. Um, but then there are other things that you might want to reference the tool for because maybe you're doing it a little something a little bit more complicated or something that you might end up using more in your work. Gotcha. Okay. Um. Th thank you very much. Um. Martin was noting that the he doesn't think the audience can raise a hand, so he doesn't have that option. Um. So I assume colleagues at RL UK are, are on that one. Uh. And might be able to fix it. Um. But we'll we'll see. If not, we'll we'll make do with chat and we'll we'll make it work. It's okay. Um. Okay. Oh no, Martin says it's been added now. Great. Um, Peter's got a question. He says there is a strong focus on ChatGPT and discussions around AI, but which other AI engines do you train people in? Uh, so we look at perplexity and U. So U is a um, an AI search engine that has basically similar to uh, Bing's Copilot. It, it's basically a chatbot attached to a search engine. So we usually look at a contrast between ChatGPT, Perplexity, and UChat. Um, and then some of the other tools that we look at in the kind of second part of the sessions are not generative AI tools. So we look at image generation, we look at tools like Research Rabbit, which is basically a citation chaining and visualization tool, tools like Elicit, that is for literature searching, um, Brian, which is a systematic reviews tool, and some other tools kind of like that, so not, not generative AI tools as such. Um, I'd love to do something around tools like um, Site AI or Consensus, but a lot of those ones are not um, not free or they're very much credit based. And I've been trying to make sure the focus is on free tools so that anyone who comes to these sessions can get something out of them. There's nothing worse than coming to a session and someone saying, "Look at this amazing tool that they can do all these amazing things." You just have to use it carefully, and then finding out that it costs twenty pounds a, a month to to get access to. So I think that's some of the the other difficulty with a lot of these tools is that. 
the best ones or the the most powerful ones are not free. Before we move on to Beth's section, Una, is there anything you would like to ask the audience? Oh, uh, I did have some questions. And this was a question just more generally around AI on how people feel about using AI themselves um, in, for example, your personal life versus your um, in your professional capacity or versus teaching students about it. So do you feel like there's a difference in the ways you might use AI whether you're using it as an individual, as a professional, or if you're teaching students about um, about the use of it. So it'll be interesting to know what people's thoughts are around the different kind of roles or different hats you might wear and how you might how that might change the way you use AI. Um, it's a really good question. Um, and while people are thinking about answering it, please, please do throw answers in the chat, raise your hand. Um, these options would be great. Um, I mean, personally, in my personal life, I suppose if I was to be applying for jobs, I'm not, I'm very happy here. But if I was to be applying for other jobs, um, I might want to use certain kind of academic leaning AI tools to help me with the the topic for the presentation or or, or considering some of the um, um, the the, question, the questions as well. So that might be an example in my personal life. I use AI tools all the time in my personal life, like just every time I get in my car, you know, I have Google Maps on and stuff. But these kind of tools, yeah, that's that's one that springs to mind for me. Let's see what people are answering. Um, okay, so um, our colleagues over in the Essex Watch Party, hi, yeah, they like to get to uh, use Elicit to get an overview of text. And that's one of my favorites. Peter's saying at DigiFest, student panel had members who actually pay a fair amount of money each month to use the pro level access. So there's that digital divide. Is that happening a lot to the panel's knowledge? Um, let's, Una, what is that happening? Um, a lot of the students that come to the sessions that I run use tools like Grammarly. So that's probably the biggest one that people seem to be subscribing to. I haven't seen a lot of people, and, and ChatGPT is the other one that people pay for access to. That that seems to happen a lot more as well. Uh, where students say, well, I've got um, ChatGPT4 because I've paid for the premium access. So when I show them, the examples in 3.5 and then they go to the the paid version of they because they can see they get different answers um because it can do do more things so i think it's becoming more and more common um but i haven't seen a lot of students yet who subscribe to lots of different tools so it seems to be more that the students i've spoken to or who've come to our sessions seem to kind of have picked a tool that they think is most helpful for them um which is is um and this is the other question. So that's just come in from the SX Watch Party that I was going to talk about is that we've been asked by academics to actually subscribe to a paid AI tool to bridge that, you know, give that equity of access access to students. And I think that would be quite interesting. I think the difficulty of, of that or the interesting part of that is which tool, what's going to be the most helpful for everyone and what has the least capacity to be misused. Because, you know, if we subscribe to a generative AI tool, are we eff effectively telling our students to go and use it? If they have access to the premium paid version of it, do we then have to put limitations on how they can use it and be really clear about that? Um, yeah, if there was a standout ethical tool, which was, mm -hmm. you know, reduced the impact in the environment, was very transparent, very responsible, maybe not, maybe not profit driven. There was maybe something like that would stand out and be very interesting for us. I guess one final thought before we move on to Beth's section is um, I've been toying with this idea of, because I've seen these prompt libraries, these paid um, databases of basically prompts that you can use for different types of things turning up. And I've been toying with the idea of effectively creating a free one for our students, a, a, a prompt, prompt library. Um, and the other question, I, if anybody's got any thoughts on that, is I've been two minds about that for, for a big reason of, on one hand, it could help bridge this digital divide that we're about to talk about um, by giving all the students access to the same prompts. And you could almost say you can, these are the prompts you can use. And if you use other prompts, then you have to explain or, or talk about it in your methodology or reference the tool that you've used. And here are the prompts that you are allowed to, to use because we could build them in a way that doesn't give students answers, but gives them points in their work that they might want to, to tweak or ways they can use these tools in ways that 
comply with academic policy and it could help with the, the students who whose uh, first language is in English or who might struggle with the digital skills of using these tools. But then on the other hand, is that taking away the learning of learning to use these tools in ways that are ethical and engage their critical thinking skills of taking away that criticality of using these tools and learning to figure out for themselves whether what they're doing is ethical or not. If we give them the answers and say, here are tools for you to, or prompts for you to use, are we taking away that learning from them if we provide something like that? Brilliant, thank, thank you, Anna. Okay, let's, let's move us on to Beth and her section then. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so I've got a few slides. I don't know if Una's going to share them. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to ex expand a little bit on um, the idea of librarians as prompt engineers and if it's something that students actually need. Um, obviously, we've gone over all the difficulties that um, are faced when students might use AI. So maybe, as Una says, we can bridge that gap. Um, but I mainly fo wanted to focus on, um, there was a recent uh, survey that Cortex conducted. Um, I don't know if we want to move on to the next slide, if you don't mind, thank you. Um, <laughs> and um, so um, they recently conducted the survey to kind of get a general overview of what students' thoughts are on AI, um, if it's something they are using. Um, obviously we've seen evidence in our own roles that they definitely are. Um, but um, this was an interesting survey. So they polled um, 1,250 UK undergraduate students. So disclaimer on this, obviously that is quite a small amount of students um, considering how many students there are in the UK alone um, who might be using AI. But I think it could give a good over, like a general overview on attitudes um, towards AI um, just generally. Um, so if you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, so I just pulled out a few numbers from this survey. Um, so in particular, the survey found that 53% of those students polled have used generative AI to help them with assessments. Um, so obviously this is only just over half, um, but it could show that this is on the rise. Um, maybe it is going to creep up each time if they conduct this survey again. Um, and it is a question of, is it only this number because of views on AI? Um, is there this negative view that maybe holds people back from using it? Um, so of the students that have used AI for any purpose, um, including for reasons not related to their studies, 37% um, have used it to enhance and edit their writing, such as by using tools like Grammarly or Notion. Um, I've used Notion myself. Um, just in my personal life uh, for ideas, for trips, that sort of thing. Um, so that only counts, that sort of thing. Um, but 30% have used it to generate text, um, such as by using chat GPT as an example. Um, so of the students who've used AI to generate text for assessment specifically, 13% um, that 30% have used them for assessments, but Cortex has noted that they do typically edit the content before submitting, with only 5% of these students saying that they use AI-generated text without editing it personally. So that's quite a small number, particularly considering it's only 1,250 students who have been polled. Um, and as well, it doesn't specify the amount of editing um, or lack of editing that goes in. Um, so are students using AI to write entire essays or are they just getting some help with wording maybe getting some key words as Una has said um, so it's definitely a gray area with this um, AI use can be perceived negatively in some capacity um, but the view that students might be using it to generate an entire assignment for example but this poll maybe suggests that isn't the case at all and most people do want to be independent using AI as a tool um, so it does seem necessary, it does seem inevitable that students will use any new tools out there to help them with their studies, but it's not necessarily in an unethical way. Um, and instead, I think this survey shows that students are most likely to use AI to assist themselves. Um, so summarising points, prompting their own thought processes, sort of coming up with templates that they can work from. 
Um, okay, um, could you move on to the next slide, please? So um, this is sort of as well in the survey you talked about how students view their institutions attitudes to AI. Um, so 30% of students agree or strongly agree that the institutions should provide tools. So it's good that UNA is working with students in this capacity. We're trying to stay ahead of the curve here um, because it, 9%, only 9% say that institutions do currently provide these tools or this advice, which is very, very low. Um, and only 22% of students say they're satisfied with the support they've received on AI. Um, so again, that is a low number um, and it does suggest that maybe we can be doing more, particularly as librarians, um, to help with this because as I said, it's kind of inevitable that AI might become part of our everyday lives. Um, so what are the ways that we can mitigate any issues with it? How can we educate people? Okay, go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I think it can be argued that it is in universities and more specifically libraries best interested to develop these clear policies on AI and teach students how to use it effectively, providing tools to prevent this digital divide that we've touched upon. Um, in the survey, the digital divide does seem quite minor in some cases. Um, so for example, they talk about how 58% of students in the fifth quintile use AI as opposed to 51% of students in the first quintile. This is a small gap, but it is good to consider, obviously, again, reiterate that this is such a small number of students that were polled, that that gap could be larger. And I think you do definitely see the difference um, between the types of um, uh, tools that the AI provides between free AI and paid for AI. Um, I had a little look at some of the DigiFest webinars that were going on recently and um, one of the presentations was about Poe and the presenter showed all these amazing things that Poe can do for free. Um, so there are definitely free tools out there that are amazing, that can do so many things, but obviously behind that paywall, you don't know if it is even better. So it's definitely something we need to look at. Um, so a lot of the hesitance that students have about AI or that I've sort of noticed from this survey seem to be a lack of clarity or guidance from the universities. Like I say, such a small um, number of students said that they do receive guidance from their universities, do get this these tools. Um, so uh, some of the survey responders notice that they're told just not to use AI at all, um, and that's it. Um, and they've been given the impression that AI can only be used unethically. So for example, for plagiarism. Um, so there are definitely students that maybe they need a bit of more guidance to show that we have these tools, um, they're out there in the world. So we would rather you use them in an ethical way and show you the best way to use them. We've also seen this hesitancy from module supervisors lecturers as well, um, just speaking from my own experience, we have had a module supervisor recently bring this up. Um, they saw a blog post that was sent out by one of our suppliers about AI. Um, and they highlighted a sort of concern about the depiction of ChatGPT in particular's knowledge bank drawing from so-called open sources. Um, and they noted that these sources, uh, these sources are under copyright still and would need to be referenced correctly if used. So again, we can go back to our workshops where we can teach students how best to reference ideas, um, if anything is drawn from generally online, um, how they can work with those sources. Um, and the module supervisor in this story also um, raised AI's tendency to hallucinate sources. So as Una said, maybe librarians as prompt engineers, we can sort of work to find the best prompts that do reduce these hallucinations. There's also the idea as well of um, training AI on specific things so that it will only um, work with this. So um, I believe it was the University of Luxembourg recently um, started working with a collection that uses AI um, to 
um, that is trained on their own collection. So if a student wanted to use it almost as a bot um, to look for a reference, it would only bring up things that um, were present in their collection and they could could be referenced. So maybe that's one way we could do it. Um, and again, we could work as librarians to create those prompts. Um, so as Una says, perhaps this is a gap that librarians can bridge. We can provide tools and guidance on how to use AI ethically and to help shoot with studies in a productive way that still has students learning ultimately, still keeping them independent. Um, and we could also open the conversation with the universities themselves to try and have that clear guidance. Um, as from the survey, it does seem that is what is wanted by students. Um, and I think as well, just to finish up, I think having librarians as prompt engineers as well, it, perhaps it could formalize or legitimize the use of AI. And maybe we can create a safe space within libraries to explore it. Um, we can put those parameters in, we can work with students rather than um, restricting them. Um, but I would be interested to hear what other people's thoughts are about this. Um, so maybe we can move into answering a couple of questions or seeing what people's thoughts are on their student experience as well. Thank you very much, Beth. And uh, that was a nice invitation, I suppose, for more students as partners work as well. I really like this prospect of working with students. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could you stop the slide share, please, Una? Fabulous. Okay, so Jackie uh, put in a question, which I'll read out. Um, I wonder how many students use generated assignments or papers in lieu of being able or not knowing if they have access to past papers, etc. Lots of students that approach us just want a comparison paper for a starting point. So maybe it's easier for them in some cases to use software than it is to access an old undergrad or MA thesis. Yeah, that is a really good point, actually. Um, I think maybe that's maybe on us. We need to advertise those um, tools that they could use without using AI a bit more um, with a bit more clarity, perhaps. Um, I think, yeah, there is definitely, I, I feel like AI in general is a bit of an unknown still for a lot of people. So maybe they turn to it because they think that there aren't other avenues. Um, and But there is maybe this sort of shame of using it as well. Um, so yeah, I think it is definitely a good point that maybe we need to explore different things that students can use before turning to AI um, specifically. Yeah, I really like that point. I haven't thought of that. that. I have seen that somebody had created, um, you know, you can create versions of different GPTs mm -hmm. and somebody had created one for British Library's ethos based on just on the metadata. It didn't go into the full text, but yeah, you could just sort of query the um, the GPT and, you know, it would give you back um, content scraped. I don't know with permission or whether that was an ethical thing to do, but <laughs> scraped from the, the metadata associated with um, ethos. Anybody like to join us at this virtual table? There is space. Can stick your hand up. Otherwise, if you prefer with the chat, that's fine. While people think um, I was going to jump in on that, the idea of like a safe space and students exploring AI and this kind of maybe fear that they don't know necessarily what other avenues there are. Um, the, I went to the ILG um, Information Literacy and AI Roundtable and um, they had somebody talking about how they use um, AI in these kind of very structured ways, because sometimes students get kind of told, I'll go and experiment with it. But if they don't have the knowledge or the confidence or the skills to use these tools, how can you really go and experiment with it if you don't know where to start? So having these kind of really structured safe spaces, like you said, and having very specific things that they can do with them and try out and see which tools they like, which what they don't like, what works for them. Um, and having that kind of non-judgmental space where they can go and try it in a structured way with an instructor present who can help them. And that's where it's important that we also have the skills to be able to help them, even if we don't know everything, if we're just willing to experiment as well and have these kind of structured workshops on hand, I think that, that can be really helpful for our students. Definitely, yeah. A couple really? questions in the chat. 
Okay, um, I'll read the one from Wendy here. So for those of us who are looking to develop our prompt engineering skills, are there any resources that you've learned from or would recommend? And Beth or Una, please pick that one up. I'm happy to pick that one up. Um, <laughs> so I've got a couple of ones that I used when I was getting started. So there's a couple of LinkedIn courses that I thought were quite helpful. A lot of them don't really get into the ethics of prompt engineering or the ethics of using these tools, but they were quite good at explaining how these tools work and how to write prompts that optimize your results. So there, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but I'm sure I can find a link to it um, during the segment. So I'll post it in the chat and if anything, we can share it afterwards. Um, but it's a LinkedIn learning course and I went to a webinar, which was called writing clearer prompts, I want to say, or getting clearer discussion. That sounds really good. Was, yeah, I focused on on this idea of clear and, and clear was an acronym they used for C was for concise, L was for logical, E was for explicit, A was for adaptive and R was for reflective. Um, and they showed different ways of writing different kinds of prompts. And they really demonstrated how if you write a prompt in this way, this is the response you get. Whereas if you write it in this way, this is the response you get. And you could really see which one was more effective for the type of thing you were trying to do. Um, so I'll share that one in the links as well. I've got a link to that somewhere. So I'll put that in the chat when I've got, a, got a moment. Yeah, but I've there done. are definitely resources out there. And these are all, the webinar recording is free out there. And if you've got access to LinkedIn Learning, then all the LinkedIn courses are available as well. Thank you. I've done the, the LinkedIn Learning course on prompt engineering. And I, I remember the trainer telling us, you know, when you're gener generating images, he said, if you add the words digital art to the end of your prompts, and he, he's found that open, eye, open, open AI tells him you get better results by doing that. And they're just little tidbits like that were really surprised me. Okay, um, things have picked up in the chat. Um, let me see. I think we're on to, so um, RRUK comment, um, AI also feels very monolithic. Um, and these discussions highlight the experience and tools which really help unpack it to be focused on what's the best tool do they, they need and agree, agree regarding safe spaces. So that's a really good concept. Uh, Peter's had a couple, uh, Peter said something, um, said this as perplexity uses a RAG model I'll confess, I don't know what that is, um, to actually actually improve prompts by assessing verified data sources. Is that any better at showing sources without hallucinations in a panel's experience? Well, you know my experience, it's just not there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd have to agree. <laughs> I'm not too familiar with that. Um unfortunately. <laughs> and that's fine, because I, I want think I want to learn things from this too. So yeah. thank you, Peter. Uh so I don't I I'll admit I don't know what the rag model is I should probably know um but what I have found is that complexity is better at finding sources that exists it doesn't hallucinate as much but the quality of the sources is not great um so we were looking at um in this morning session we were doing quite a lot of interactive stuff with generative AI and perplexity used a lot of um, sources like blog posts and essay mills and it would even reference things like reddit um so even though all of these existed and it was mostly just kind of recycling the content, it wasn't generating as much new um, new ways to say. It was mostly just sort of summarizing what was in these sources. But the sources were coming from places like essay mills and blog posts and, and that sort of thing. Um, whereas when we used Copilot, for example, that actually brought in academic papers and university websites. But then somebody else used Copilot and got essay mills and blog posts and, and that sort of thing. So it's seem to be really varied. Uh, some of these tools, you can tell them where you want the information from. So ChatGPT, for example, you can tell it to only use government sources or .ac.uk um, websites and then that sort, those sorts of sources. Um, but you have to know how to do that and like knowing, having those tips and tricks and figuring out how to phrase it in a way that doesn't then limit things too much. Gotcha. Okay. Um, James asked um, everybody, is it, have they made the new Scopus AI tool available for their students? We haven't, but please, everybody, um, reply to James in the chat about that one. Let's see. Um, Susan, who I used to work with. Hi, Susan. Do you think the need for safe spaces to explore AI also extends to staff? Have you had an experience of working with academic staff and library colleagues? And if so, have their responses and feedback been similar to what you've heard from students? 
Um, I would say I think we do need those spaces for staff as well because they're going. They're the ones who are in the classrooms with the students. Um, they're the ones who maybe will be working with them. Um, in their seminars, um, students might bring these things up. So maybe they need that space as well to kind of explore it and know what's best for their students too. Um, I think. To be honest, a lot of staff feedback hasn't been the most positive so far, um, but I think a lot of that is to because of a concern of academic integrity, which is understandable. Um, so, yeah, I would say that is definitely important, too. I don't know if anyone else would think the same. I, I would um, agree, but I will, I will probably move us on with the interest of the session, but, but yeah, I agree. Um, just Peter's just um, update us on what, on what RAG is, and apparently it's Retrieval Augmented genera uh, Generation. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And now the chat's come into that, so that is that is great. Thank you. What we'll do now is we'll move to our final section, um, and we have permission to run over a little bit if we need to, so there will be time for a decent chat. Um, Beth, you're going to share the slides for me, aren't you? Okay, so uh, for the final part, um, I'm going to look towards the future, which is you know, very, very risky in such a fast paced um, environment, but just taking one aspect of it, we're really just considering plagiarism for a moment. Um, and this is a fantastic model, um, please move us on, um, that I've uh, seen and talked to colleagues about, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it all. Um, the idea from Sarah Elaine Eaton about post plagiarism, and she um, summarizes some of the points in this book that she's um, mentioned at the top there um, into this really helpful um, model. Yeah, model, and um, I'll just consider some of them, and we'll also look at um, uh, you know an active example as a way to really think about it. So just to summarize what's going on here, these six tenants, the, the first one, the I, and this was written, I should note, this was written at the end of 2020. So um, for me, Eaton is a kind of AI Nostradamus, able to see quite far in the future. And I've been just really impressed with the foresight going on. But yeah, um, so hybrid human AI writing becoming normal. So this idea of hybrid writing was a really interesting concept of you know, the human obviously doing most of the work, but um, augmented by help from the generative AI. Um, and so Elaine, um, so Eaton argues that trying to determine where the human ends and the artificial intelligence begins is pointless and futile. So she's kind of predicted how a lot of people were very interested in detection tools um, and um, how we've kind of moved on from that already. Um, and that there is much less now conversation about you know, getting a percentage score to detect whether you know this is written by Gen AI. It's, um, I think we're starting, I would argue we're starting to move towards this already. Um, she talks about human creativity and how that can be enhanced by, but not threatened by AI. Something I've, I've kind of been thinking about during this conference is really, um, these tools are really effective and useful when you play to their strengths. So when you um, look at something like uh, get, getting getting them to generate keywords for you, um, putting something through particular models when it comes to systematic searching, things where there's lots of training data, um, you know, those are strengths. Um, but when when we talk about creativity, um, I think this is something that humans personally are much better at than um, AI tools. So um, yeah, I'm I'm not fully on board with this one, but um, the point is that really you know, creativity can be boosted with the right environment. That probably makes sense. Um, the idea of overcoming language barriers, which is something we probably don't talk about much in these conferences because most of us are native English speakers and English is the dominant language of um, academia. So we're probably not even thinking about it as much, um, but it's, it's very interesting. And anecdotally, I, you know, the people I know who's, language, uh, first language is not English, they have been particularly keen on using AI tools such as Grammarly, but then throwing uh, emails into um, chat GPT and similar tools and saying, yeah, does this sound okay? Can you soften the tone here? Um, it, it, it saves time by everything else. It, it's not It's not always just about um, language learning or language ability. 
Um, and then the idea that humans can relinquish control, but not responsibility. And it, this scares me. Um, relinquishing control, um, it's not something I like, but um, the idea of, but I mean, anecdotally, you know, in my team, we, we generate meeting notes through um, Claude.ai. Um, we give, take, give it the Zoom transcript um, and make sure we're not to mention anything um, sensitive, anything like that. We give it to Claude and Claude will summarize for us, which saves some people some time. And, you know, I don't know the back end of Claude's algorithm or anything like that. So that's why we don't give it anything sensitive or personal. You know, we, we vet the, uh, the transcript first. Um, and, but, I, I fully agree that you know humans need to be um, keeping the responsibility here, um, and attribution remaining important. Again, that's a massive area for us in libraries. That is um, you know, academic integrity, and this is really, really, really key. And Eaton is not debating it. And um, then the idea of historical definitions of plagiarism no longer um, applying. And what we're saying is we're not throwing out the idea of plagiarism in the future with in the landscape with uh, AI tools but it doesn't as we kind of understand it now it does need to be transcended so it's not I suppose it's not a matter of the goalpost shifting and us having to adapt it's pl we're playing a different sport so it's not just you know there's another dimension to this you know what plagiarism is in or thought to be in the future years Eaton would argue is going to change Okay, so let's look at an example which was shared recently on social media and think about some of these. So here we go. Uh, this paper was all over X or Twitter and most of the commentary, um, so let me explain what's happening here. So we've got we've got a journal article in surfaces and interfaces and we, you know, the abstract reads fine, the title reads fine, obviously not my area, I don't understand this stuff, but the introduction starts with the words, certainly, here's a possible introduction for your topic. So that is clearly the authors um, who are based at, mostly based at a university in Beijing ha apparently have um, generated the introduction using ChatGPT or a similar tool. Um, and, and then what follows, people have been maybe skeptical about you know, the validity, the quality of the work as a result. On X, a lot of the commentary has been, look at this. I can't believe this. I couldn't believe it's true, but it is. Um, and perhaps, you know, how, is, how has this got past the peer reviewers and the editors? Um, but that's really about as far as it's gone as what I've seen. In LinkedIn, there's been a bit more nuance and um, a few more kind of um, maybe probing questions. And I will personally um, say that I have a bit of sympathy for the authors here. Um, and I don't think it's, it's I don't think it's helpful to just say, oh, look, look at this plagiarism, ring the bell. I think we have to start to take on what some of Eaton's saying and move on a bit. If could you click slide forward once, but that should bring up an animation. There we go. So um this is um a comment I saw from LinkedIn looking around the commentary of this. And the question that raised here is what about so okay, yes, plagiarism suspicious. Um the authors you know, have contravened Elsevier's policy and they've not acknowledged that they've used um, ChatGPT or a similar tool here in the in, in, in the, um, the sections towards the end. So there is obviously wrong clueing here. Um, but what this person questions is, you know, what about conscientious authors who've done the quality scientific word, you know, in the main body of the paper and, and perhaps the abstracts, and then they've used an LLM to save some time on unnecessary writing. I wouldn't use the phrase unnecessary writing personally, but I understand the point. If I'm writing a long article and then I need to get, make, write the abstract and do a bit of introduction just for context setting, you know, why not use a tool to to help you with that kind of stuff and just feed, feed it what you're giving it so far? Some people could think that way and I can fully understand that. And when, you know, your first language isn't English and you're being kind of norms or pushing you to write in you know uh, the the language uh, that isn't isn't the one you use every day at work all the more reasons so um i think some of the things we looked at with eaton are already applying here we've got the hybrid writing we've got the um the barrier of translation coming down um and yeah i personally you know do have certain sympathies but you know, of course uh, following the elsevier guidelines um it's fine to use this these uh, tools for readability it says 
but what the authors should have done is acknowledge that they'd used uh, ChatGPT or a similar tool. Um, I suppose the question then is that well, would people um, question the, the quality of the writing if they had been open about doing that, which is something we may well see soon. And we did see that initial batch of people acknowledging uh, ChatGPT as a co-author and um, the pub certain publishers really not being keen on that. But yes, um, this is just a, maybe a working example of some of this stuff happening in practice. So um, let's stop sharing at that point and um, have a chat about it. Okay. So co-panelists, while people are thinking, um, any any thoughts on, on plagiarism and Eaton's thoughts and arguments? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've been, it's, it's not something I tend to cover with students. I feel like it's it's something that can get really confusing for students, but it's something that yeah. when I've had these conversations with staff, I think it's been quite quite an interesting thing to, an interesting resource to bring in. A lot of times they've got a lot of concerns around some of the, some of the tenets and some of the points. But the one I've been trying to focus on really is the, is the very first one, um, well, the one about relinquishing control but not responsibility. And that's still a message we share with students about the, the kind of ethical or transparent use of AI is kind of pointing out that they are encouraged to use these tools and this is potentially something that they will be using when they go and um, get jobs or go into further education, look at PhDs, you know, once they start specializing a bit they might be looking at, at, at ways of, of automating certain tasks or being asked to do that at work but that's where it's really crucial for them to understand that even though they might be submitting something or they might be using these AI tools they're still responsible for the content that they produce so even though it, it might be AI generated they're still responsible for checking the quality of it the factualness of it and ensuring that what they're submitting is still high quality and doesn't contain errors and doesn't contain immediate sort of biases or um or mistakes in that way. And and that's what that tenant to me is really about. It's about making sure that even if you're not generating the content, you're still checking it because you're responsible for it. You're effectively the AI supervisor in that way. Yeah, it's really nicely um expressed there. Uh, sometimes I think about it, we're kind of moving from being just authors to being like authors and editors when we when we use machines in the, in this kind of way and it's it's an, another skill set which um, brings us on back onto the topic quite nicely um okay um so final call anybody want to pop the hand up you're welcome to um we get we can run over a little bit and that's fine um but assuming not we'll just dive into the chat so question here for for una how's this work being received in your institution um, well, we're only just starting it. So I ran a the very first iteration of, of this workshop that I'm aiming at staff yesterday. Um, and that was was really, really well received. They were quite concerned with the AI detection side of things. And that's where I mean, it's, it's anytime I have a conversation with an academic, they always tend to go, this is amazing, looks really cool, great work. Well, what about detection, though? How do we check if students have, have done it? the way you're teaching them to do it? Have you? Is there a way for us to detect AI writing? And generally the answer is always no, and they know it's no. Um, but the work itself seems to be quite quite well received. So we're gonna be putting it on um, our like central staff training database. It's gonna be part of the, the strategic initiative for, for training staff. So I think that's, that's gonna be really, really awesome. Um, and hopefully somewhere where we can start these discussions with academics, because there are some who are very, very against it, some who are very, very pro. And then there are the kind of high majority that I would say that are ca cautiously pro, where they kind of have these concerns or they have these slight fears, but actually they kind of just really want to learn how to use it. And they recognize that their students are using these tools. But I'm hoping to really convert the people who are really, really against and maybe rein in some of the people who are really, really pro um and making sure we're all giving the students the same message that's what i'm really hoping this to be about and that's what a lot of these academics seem to want this to be about as well is that they all have a message that they can preach to their students because a lot of them just don't know they haven't got the time they haven't got the resources they haven't got the knowledge to go and experiment and spend the same time as we have um because they are teaching and they're talking to their students but they might not have 
the kind of up-to-date knowledge of where their students are or what, what tools they're using. So in that way, we can give them something that they can then talk to their students about. And that's what these academics seem to be coming to us with, is that they really just want something that they can give to their students and say, this is what the library has given us. Here are the resources. This is the message. These are the things you can do. These are the things you can't do. You want to know more, go talk to the library. Um, which is, is is the way I'm hoping to position this. And they seem to be getting quite quite nice um, attendance. And anytime we put AI in the title of anything, it seems to always attract lots of people, which is great. Um, it's an, an easy way to get engagement. <laughs> yeah. And um, and what you'd be talking about there is a lot about what's happened these previous days of the conference of the the opportunities there for libraries to take a lead and um and you know the others will will follow us and we can we can influence colleagues very positively and I think you've just illustrated that nicely. Um, Susan in the chat has said about um, the research of under policy group and their st joint statement on the use of Gen AI and how it doesn't condemn use of AI for grant funding but requires acknowledgement and res advises responsible use. So it seems quite in line with Eaton and her, um, her arguments there. Okay. Um, before we close down then, um, I just want to ask fellow panelists, was there any other questions you wanted to ask the audience? I think we've covered most of what I had to ask. I'm just having a quick look through the chat in case there's anything that we fell out from or didn't pick up. I'd love to know if anyone gets a set is has subscribed to any AI tools of course I, I probably I think maybe people haven't but does anyone get the sense any institution is close probably I would think that this there there are places where these conversations are happening I think mm. what it may be boiling down to is is which tool because this is the thing that we've been talking about a lot is about the how quickly things change in this field. And if you subscribe to a tool, what if that tool becomes obsolete because something more powerful that is now free or slightly cheaper becomes available? And I think that's been maybe the thing that stopped places from pulling the pulling the trigger and actually subscribing to a tool. Um, not that I know of, um, but... Also, institutional licenses, you know. They, you might not be able to purchase them on behalf of your institution in yeah. all cases. Yeah. Um, okay. So some nice, very nice comments here. Um, thank you. Uh, Laura saying, who else in the institution is doing the work? Is it the sole responsibility of libraries? Over at Cambridge, it seems to be devolved by digital technologists, computer officers, digital humanities. I think I think we seem to be not, not sole leaders, but um, I think we've seen, you know, thanks to the work of Una and others, um, we seem to be um, kind of taking a lead on that. Are there, is any, am I forgetting anyone, Una? Uh, I mean, we have a central AI group that integrates more of the like university office holders and some of the IT and um, organizational development colleagues. But I think a lot of the work that's been done directly with students is is mostly through us, um, aside from sort of individual academics who might have personal experience or knowledge knowledge with the tools. But most of the sort of teaching and the director for teaching is, is coming really from us, but we've got a central working group that's looking at more policy level things and strategic level um, approaches. Um, gotcha. Somebody did have a question about um, prompt library schemas and sort of classification standards. Uh, not that I know of, to be honest. Um, it's something that's on my list of things to go and have a look at because I've been toying with this idea of a prompt library, in which case we would need some um, some kind of schema or metadata for for these prompts um, to be able to actually use them and find them. Um, but not that I know of. If, if anybody does know of any, please do share. Great. And yeah, we'll start to wind down now. But um, yeah, Susan made the point about Copilot as well. That seems to be the, the product that's available and something you can turn on. And perhaps you can do that in subtle ways. So that's probably step one. It kind of gets back full circle, isn't it? Yeah, you know, we all have Microsoft operating systems on a computer because they were they were there first um on mass scales and it's kind of history repeating itself 